time had gone soft at the crossroads. And let me tell you how. In the bright spring sunshine, a ruddy autumnal smell of bonfires and whiskey rose from the earth. The land was bathed in monochrome. A nearby cluster of barrows glowed with psychedelic sepia tones. This landscape remembers it remembers every footfall and wheel roll and bears each of these as lines upon its face. It was the first of May, and I was up long before the day. A half-inch layer of mist covered everything. The spider's webs, the dropped Stella empties, my breath. Each was coated with a milky film and a floral taste like fresh-cut herbs. Down at Twittern, I came to a park. We'd picnicked there the day after my grandmother's funeral the last time my family would all gather in Stenning. Stenning, that strange town, so full of spirits, one can hardly move. Even in these tightening lanes, the seasons cycle around and around. Just outside the town, at the Round Hill, I watched dawn choristers flock up the downs into a dull glow of rising sun, the sky a turner wash. I followed and could soon see in the distance the ring, Shanktonbury ring. It seemed to levitate between earth and sky in holy persecution. Battered and broken, its spine snapped. Since the storm, I have to work to see Shanktonbury the way it once was, augmented with childhood memories, fleshed out with scores of beaches in its tight circle, a flourishing island atop the stark oceanic downs. It is shattered now, but if I squint, I can still see them the ghost trees. I approached the ring and found sheep clustered within. They corralled their lambs among the trees. The mist hugged and highlighted the outlines of an ancient hill fort. 
and wisps of fairy-like wool snagged on the bare spring branches, dressing the trees like dream catchers, each one a memory. And I thought of Belloc as he too walked this place. The moon stood over Shanktonbury, so removed and cold in her silver that you might almost have thought her careless of the follies of men. Sleep came at last to me also, but that night dead friends visited in dreams. Shanktonbury Ring is the thin place on my map. That place where another world peeks through. It's where I go to believe, to remember that I can believe. It's there that dead friends visit and dead voices gather. Memories linger and haunt like snagged wool. Many have felt this way and for thousands of years. Yet we each hold that experience as ours alone. Just as the ghost trees appear, so too Winnie, my grandmother. I see her there, not just living, but alive. Like many have done at Shanktonbury, she levitates, just barely, above a felled trunk or protruding chalk head. And on the first of May, I found her there and I fell into a haze, a warm opioid befuddlement. It's a feeling I think might be called religious. I wasn't raised to recognize such things, but it sure felt like it. Mystics dreamt of being swallowed by an oceanic landscape, and that makes sense on Shanktonbury, breathing in miles of land and air, divided only by the thin white line of the old chalk road. People see things on that hillside. They hear things. They are indeed levitated. I may not know what it feels like to believe in something, but it must be a bit like this. Buzzed with a warm confusion, I saw my dead grandmother hover a half inch above a fallen tree's trunk, just for an instant, and then gone. And there, atop Shanktonbury, on the first day of May, I heard bells ring in the swaddling mist. Chankleberry, Changeberry, Chinkberry, Shanktonberry, Chankleberry, Changeberry, Chink, Chink, Shank, Shankberry, Shanktonberry, Chankleberry, Changeberry, Shangeberry, Shankleberry, Shangeberry, Shankberry, Shanktonberry, Chanktonberry, Chank. Chanktonbury, 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 Chankton, 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 Chanktonbury, 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 Chanktonbury. Once the trees were thick enough to harbor darkness at midday.
But the trees were latecomers, mere centuries ago. The hill's name, whatever strange sound that was, rang out like a bell in the mist for thousands of years before they grew, long before anything like English was spoken here. I walked the ring, the trees a teenage boy planted in the 18th century, now thinned by the great storm. I had come to scour for a fallen tree trunk, a place I had sat alone as a child on my first visit to Shanktonbury. But this time, I was not alone. Something was watching me from the old road that crosses the downs. I couldn't see. I couldn't see, but, but I could hear. I could, I, could, I could hear those bells. Bells like an entity passing by. Up on the down, the red-eyed kestrels hover, eyeing the grass. The field mouse flits like a shadow into cover as their shadows pass. Men are burning the gorse on the down's shoulder. A drift of smoke glitters with fire and hangs and the skies smolder and the lungs ch ch choke. Once the tribe did thus on the downs, on these downs, burning men in the frame, crying to the gods of the downs till their brains were turning and the gods came. And today on the downs, in the wind, the hawks, the grasses, in blood and air, something passes me and cries as it passes on the chalk down and bare. The bells grew louder, voices too. I circled back to the other side of the ring and saw straw hats strewn with flowers emerge from the hillocks. I hid, biding my time, as I watched the Morris men gather at the ring's eastern edge. All white with bright red sashes, Bells sewn into their boots and trousers. Hats and vests studded with buttons and spiked with feathers. They were at the ring to dance in the May, to welcome the summer atop the downs where it might first arrive as if sprinkled from above. There were so many of them and so few of us, civilians, I mean, audience. It was mist raining and chilly very early in the morning. Almost no one was watching. By earthly standards, not a great gig. But they began to dance, and then I knew this had nothing to do with us. There they stepped in the same patterns in which bearded men had stepped a century before them, maybe in the same place. Morris won't make the rains or the harvest come. No child will flourish because of this dance, and God knows no fertility will be enhanced. It is a checkpoint, a diary entry written onto the earth at Shanktonbury, 
with footsteps, like lines accrued on a face. That, that is tradition. That is its sole purpose, to be enacted and ever so. A place could not be thinner for such an undertaking. At Shanktonbury, each subsequent invader of the Downs had discovered new unknowns. Two thousands years ago, the Druids found barrows already older than memory and invented stories to explain them. Now we do the same. The Romans built temples there, at least two in their time and worshipped pagan gods while fearing the ones that lingered in the old fortress visible in the ground. The Saxons found the ruined temples and practiced their own religion. When Christ came, his house was built at the foot of the Downs. But Shanktonbury? That was for Woden. Eight hundred years ago, an incident. A monk killed mysteriously at Shanktonbury on the eve of the nativity of St. John the Baptist, a night marked by bonfires and drunkenness, the summer solstice. The traditional meeting place of Sussex witches is Shanktonbury Ring, wrote Doreen Valiente. A coven, an unbroken line of the old religion, figment of Valiente's imagination, perhaps. But in the 20th century, a London businessman is found in the center of the ring, gun by his side, bullet through his heart. Two girls from Worthing plot their own deaths by poison on a carriage ride over the down. The sentiment, a place of ritual, a place of life and death, that was there. The Morris danced on forever. Their clashing sticks and jingling bells receded into the mist as I circled the trees till I found something familiar. And there, among the snagged wool and the snagged mist, I put my hand on a young tree, spun myself around, and stopped with a sharp breath. There she was, Winnie. I don't often see the dead. Certainly no more than anyone else. Because we all see the dead sometimes, don't we? Waiting on a cloud-darkened bench, or passing us by on a side street, or, or, or fumbling for their keys in the hallway. But there she was, hovering above a log, in a skirt made for walking, and that thin beige windbreaker, ubiquitous in 1980s England. Her hair showed its first flashes 
of a graying corona, and her elbows were pinned in impatience, as though holding a saucer and a teacup. She didn't move or acknowledge me, and I never saw her face. And then she was gone. Now, I, I can't convince you that it happened. I couldn't draw a diagram, map the winds of that particular day in that particular place. But it did happen. It did. At an anonymous point, above a field, past the A road, the way begins in false quiet. Where the white noise of mechanization, of acceleration and shifting gears, mixes into the wind hum of grass and squeak of starling. The road blends too, paving becomes stone, stone becomes stubble, 
Stubble becomes soil and grass, and soon, before you know it, before you're really ready, grass becomes chalk. On my first visit to England, Winnie and I walked to Shanktonbury. We passed through the hallway of Mouse Lane, a road for 500 years under this name alone, its walls of root-strewn earth towering either side. As we turned up the verge of the downs and climbed along the path, the canopy obscured our views until we emerged at the crest and looked out onto the ring and the old road spiraling beyond. And as she walked, Winnie pivoted. She became a different self, pragmatist and pessimist. She usually erred on the side of not. I loved her then and love her still. Loved her always iffy weather forecasts. Her habit of removing family photos to spare her children the burden of adoration. I love her because I could see that other self the one that spewed folk tales like magic spells to let us rise above the damnable reality of Earth and see something more. I could see the one that let us believe. As we walked the path to Shanktonbury, my grandmother told me of its creation. A few miles east lies Devil's Dyke, a deep, dry coombe cut into the landscape by a river, spawned from the disillusion of Ice Age permafrost. The river is gone, the valley remains. That's one story, Winnie told me another. The devil, she said, wished to destroy Sussex and wandered the county in search of occasion. There, he encountered St. Dunstan, a wise and wily Sussex man. Being a cocky fellow, Beelzebub gave Dunstan the choice of how his homeland would be destroyed. Dunstan proposed that the county be flooded, but how to do it? After all, the Downs protect Sussex, protect it from encroachment of the sea. And to cut through the hills would take ages upon ages, even for the likes of the devil. The bait was taken, the bet was made. The downs would be cut through before daybreak, or the devil would leave Sussex alone. Satan ducked and cut through the night, well on his way to completing his task, when something happened. My grandmother told me that an old woman was awakened by the ruckus and investigating with a lantern climbed over the downs, her light appearing as the dawn and sending an infuriated devil running. Belloc tells this tale too, but in his version it's the power of prayer, St. Dunstan rising every rooster in the west to crow at once. 
The Devil's Dyke remains, as do the mounds of chalky earth he furiously shoveled to and fro. Landing across the county, piles at Mount Caburn and Rackham Mount, Ditchling Beacon and Sisbury Ring, and of course, Shanktonburg. The Devil lives on. Winnie told me how running around the ring seven times Widdershins would summon him, complete with an ambiguous bowl of soup. That story changes too, the summon becoming a legion of Roman soldiers, or a horde of Saxon berserkers. Perhaps merely a twinkling of fairies, a murder of crows, or a clattering of jackdaws. Inside the ring of trees at Shanktonbury, I discovered darkness at midday. I slipped into the foliage, sat on a tree trunk, and not for the first time, left my body and levitated above. The first time was in the crunch of fresh snow underfoot, walking home at five years old. I lost all sense of time, wandered around the corner, to where I knew a red wheelbarrow lay buried beneath feet of brittle snow. The following season, I somersaulted down the verge of grass in front of our house, where I dug into the green and dirt. Things slowed, and I stared at the crisp fragility of a single blade of grass rolled between thumb and forefinger. The air turned viscous, a molasses haze that made each movement a swim stroke. I floated above and watched myself as I flipped that blade of grass again and again. And this is what happened at Shanktonbury as a child, alone for a few moments among the trees. My little body my little soul were ajar. The rules governing the world had made a micro-shift. I stared at myself and knew that this me was real, that he exists in this one particular place and this one particular time, nowhere else and never again. I have felt the molasses haze periodically, falling asleep to my father's voice, or waking at 5 a.m. to stare out the window into an empty streetlight ice glare, or searching for that red wheelbarrow. Is it escapist to say, out of body? This is the recognition of a truth by its suspension. I imagine we all have it in our young lives, and from time to time afterwards, that shock of existence. And it comes without warning. Except at Shanktonbury, because there I experience it again and again. On the 1st of May, I sat and tuned in to the faint clashing of Morris sticks and the buzz of awakening fauna and the world slowed, and the air became thick, and I hovered, suspended, like the kestrel. I looked down at this careful earth, the buds, the birds, the chalk, all newly detailed. It was back, the spirit, like a child, here, in this thinnest of places.
I re-emerged from the trees and moved more slowly, more delicately. I noticed the distinct snow-like crunch of scruffy grass beneath my feet, the smokiness of the misty air. Shanktonbury is often portrayed as not sunny, not gloomy, but within a glowing wash of white or sepia or graphite. As morning took hold, I saw that atmosphere approach. It would be day soon, truly day, sunny and burnt and cloudless, recklessly blue. But for now, the morning too was molasses slow. That morning looped all the Shankton breeze, Chankel breeze, change breeze that had come before. The Morris men had quit their leaps. Sticks leaned once again on beaches, both ancient and new. A concertina unstrapped, gently placed atop a black case. They had joined the landscape. They had joined the loop. And, and they began to sing. The sun stretched its rays and broke through. The numbness quit my fingertips. I slipped away. No one knew me. No one noticed me leave, unless Winnie was still watching. I skipped down the hillside along tapering tracks. And like that, the calendar had turned. And it was summer. Thank you.